Welcome to episode 74, Countertransference as a Catalyst for Therapeutic Change and Values-Aligned Business Practices, featuring Kim Dwyer, Licensed Clinical Psychologist, by Clearly Clinical, Learn, Grow, Shine. Hello to our listeners. Today we are joined by Dr. Kimberly Dwyer. She is a licensed clinical psychologist in Denver, Colorado, and she is in private practice and is also the co-owner and manager of a small group practice. She specializes in coaching and clinical consultation with private practice owners. Uh, Kim, thank you for being here today and joining us. Thanks so much, Beth. I'm excited to be here and to, to chat a little bit. Absolutely. So today we're going to be talking about the therapist's emotional experience and how this can be brought into the room therapeutically and also how it impacts our business practices, kind of that concept of countertransference. Um, Kim, please tell us more about you and then also how this topic came to be something that's important to you. Sure, absolutely. I am a clinical psychologist. I um, have been working in a variety of settings in the last uh, two decades that I've been post-degree. I did a lot of work in graduate school and community mental health and state hospital kinds of work, um, and then kind of cut my teeth working in schools after I left graduate school, which took me you know, through a journey of, of learning some different skills um, that really transitioned well into private practice. So I started my practice about 10 years ago. And then kind of combine that with another psychologist to form a small group practice about four years ago. So across that journey, my training had been primarily cognitive behavioral. Coming out of school in the late 90s, I think most of us that were in at that time probably had similar um, background depending on the schools that we were at. And over time, and especially in working with a lot of folks with anxiety um, and mood issues, I really increased my knowledge of so-called third wave therapies, so mindfulness-based practice um, and ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy and use those to really inform the work that I was doing with folks. And over time, bringing more of that into my own practice, what I found is looking at the philosophy behind acceptance and commitment therapy um, and really that um, idea of digging into our own values and using our emotions as a lens into our values. Um, I see it as a, a therapeutic modality, but also more as a, a philosophy of being, frankly, um, a way of tapping into what's important to us and trying to align ourselves with that. And in my own work in private practice, I think my entry into private practice was probably similar to a lot of people of, okay, I'm at this point in my career where I want to do this thing for myself, um, which sounds great, although I don't have a lot of training in running a business. I have a lot of training in, in you know, my clinical skills, my expertise, but the um, how to run the business, how to put together a mission, how to translate that into my policies and procedures was kind of a learn on the fly thing for me. And in looking at it more closely, when I dug into my values around my business and how my reactions and the things that, you know, really either lit me up or, you know, really bugged me, quite honestly, that that was a good indication of something going on in my business that maybe was working really well or wasn't working so well. Um, and, you know, a light bulb moment of like, let's look at what's going on here and make sure that this feels authentic to me. And that's what I've seen in working with my practice coaching clients. So helping them to really be aware of their values and then move those values into practice, into action um, by setting their policies, by interacting in ways that are aligned with their values, by using, you know, understanding their marketing as a way of connecting with their values and sharing their values with other people. Found that those things have been super valuable to folks I've worked with. Thank you for being here to share this with us. I think in a lot of ways, when it comes to business practices, we operate in, in a lot of gray area and that can be very uncomfortable that we, we want to have a hard and fast rule about how things should be done. But I think this exploration of how our values come into play with what we are comfortable with as individuals or as groups, um, I think that is a really important perspective to have. 
So tell me, for those listeners that don't know that much about ACT, tell me a little bit about ACT and its perspective and then how it ties in with this discussion about values and countertransference. Sure. So ACT, or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, looks at understanding our experiences in the present moment. So, and that, that pulls highly from that Eastern concept of mindfulness and mindfulness. Um, I, th- I think a great working definition of that, I think this is from John Kabat-Zinn, is that it's focused attention to the present moment without judgment. So bringing ourselves to right now um, and taking our experience in the right now and kind of stripping it away from our interpretations, um, our thoughts, our expectations, you know, our worries. I think of it almost like the, the conceptual grid that we look through that colors everything that we see based on past experience um, and just looking at it for what it is right now. And in the present moment, our emotions um, and our senses are really good ways of tapping into that because a sensory experience can only be present moment. I can't feel something right now. I can have a memory of a feeling, but I can't feel something with my fingers that happened in the past or that hasn't happened yet. And similarly, our emotions, the the physiological experience of our emotions, not the memory or the interpretation of our emotions, but the physiological experience of, you know, I'm nervous. My heart feels like it's beating a little bit fast. My face feels a little warm and flushed, or I can feel like a tremble in my voice. Those are all very much present moment experiences. So when we take... Um, that constellation of being present as part of ACT. Um, And then another huge portion of that is looking at peeling off our interpretation so that we talk about thought diffusion. So fusion, if you think about like fusion with a nuclear reactor is when you're gluing two things together and defusion is separating them. So we're separating our experience from the thought interpretations that are around it. And that allows us, you know, the A for act acceptance to accept this thing that's going on in the present moment for what it is. It's, it's an experience rather than fighting it, avoiding it, um, pretending it's not going on, you know, owning that this experience is happening right now. And then the final piece to that is values. Um, So, so committing to what our value system is and using that as a guide to move our, actions and our intentions in line um, with with our values, with what's right for us deep in our core. So that's a little bit about ACT um, in general. And I think the, the, the piece of this that really comes into the therapy room from the therapist's perspective is that when we're healthy um, in our own emotional reactions, then our own emotional reactions become a really rich source of information about present moment experience with our clients. So when it comes to applying ACT on an individual level, how do you see that in the day-to-day for clinicians? You know, we're so used to teaching skills to clients. And then what you're talking about is actually making sure we're applying it ourselves in the day-to-day. Yeah. So looking at it from an ACT perspective, um, we have a present moment experience all the time. But when we're in the room with our client or when we're on the phone with a prospective client or frankly doing anything in relation to our business, we have this rich field of information coming in. Um, And to the extent that we can be present to that as information that may be helpful to us on our, you know, our journey in private practice, our journey in helping a particular client, we can use that information um, as as almost like an internal guide um, for how to support them, how to uh, support our business, um, how to um, connect deeply with our own value system and use that um, to move towards uh, therapeutic goals. Um, And I'm saying therapeutic goals, I'm thinking of clients, but also business goals when we think about how we use that information um, to help develop our business policies, our procedures, our mission for our work, um, the way that we interact with people, you know, potential clients, potential referral sources, um, all of those things can really be informed by our experience. Um, So some you know, some possible examples are, I, I always feel like when we have a really strong emotional reaction, that's where the rich information is coming from. Um, and often those really strong emotional reactions come about when we have a conflict, um, either an internal conflict between two things that we hold near and dear that aren't lining up with each other, or sometimes a conflict between a value that we hold 
and the reality that's in front of us, the way somebody's interacting with us, the way um, a boundary is being approached and, you know, either respected or, you know, potentially violated. Um, those are often the places where we have that, that big pop of internal emotion that signals something's, something's out of whack between um, my values with each other or my values with what I'm experiencing right now. I think this topic, particularly for private practitioners, can be really loaded and kind of scary mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because most of us, if not all of us that went into this field, have a desire to work with people. Um, we are people, people. We want to mm-hmm. heal. We're natural healers. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it almost feels like that could clash into business acumen. And that becomes a space that could be um, kind of uh, conflict ridden. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And um, I have kind of two directions to go in based on what you're saying. You know, One that came up for me immediately. And again, some of this is probably that my training was not particularly psychodynamic, but much more CBT oriented. Um, but the, the topic of countertransference, you know, at its most basic is I therapists have an, a, a reaction and experience, um, a feeling, you know, about or towards my client. Um, and, you know, depending on your approach to that, like for, I think for a lot of us, we were trained, you know, we're kind of a blank slate. We should go in there and, you know, just acceptance, unconditional positive regard. Um, we shouldn't be having like negative feelings towards our client. And when we do, like, that's scary because I'm here because I like people. I'm here because I want to serve people because I have faith in their ability to, to heal through this process. And if I don't like them or if they did something that is bothering me, you know, maybe that means I'm not a good therapist. Maybe I'm not good enough. When the reality is that we're human, <laughs> we're going to have that. We're going to have emotional reactions to other people. Um, so you know, we can we can kind of peel that layer again of judgment off of the concept of countertransference. So it's it's just a reaction in the moment um, that could give us some information that maybe could help a person um, if we use that therapeutically, you know, and again, that's when that unconditional positive regard can come in that I can have an experience to you um, that maybe isn't positive in the moment, but that doesn't negate the idea that we have this potential for growth together um, by using that and um, you know, using that in a way that is safe for the client. When I had the uh, pleasure of being at the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference a couple of years ago, the topic of countertransference and the emotional experience of the therapist was a, a major topic. Um, and absolutely, uh, essentially, the guidance of moving away from the blank slate therapist and bringing therapists into the room. But I think that in, for therapists can inspire a lot of fear and vulnerability of like, well, if I do that, <laughs> like, then I'm, I'm, I'm using myself as a tool. And that could be scary. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there, there's some real safety in being a blank slate <laughs> that, that, you know, I, um, I, I don't have to share those things, you know, with other people, my life can be extremely private. Um, and, you know, and that's where I think this polyvagal theory, looking at polyvagal theory is really interesting. So if, if we're coming into that relationship and, and, a relationship that's deeply personal. We're asking, you know, from the get-go in an intake, we're asking really personal questions of people. You know, hopefully we're doing something to try and establish some rapport first and make them, you know, feel safe and comfortable in the setting. But you, know, most of us jump in and get into real personal stuff, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, polyvagal theory looks at the idea that there are Uh, kind of nonverbal neurophysiological indicators of safety that allow us to have a full emotional expression. And if you look at that within um, a psychotherapy piece or a psychotherapy framework, if we are being a blank slate um, and not really reflecting back a whole lot of emotionality and, you know, maybe, um, you know, doing the typical, "Mm -hmm, tell me more about that and nodding and those things, you know, which are, which are genuine, but it's not really a deep emotional um, reaction or connection necessarily. Um, it makes it harder for clients to kind of align emotionally with us and feel safe to share that. Um, and by the same token, if we don't do that as therapists, then we don't really feel safe um, in in that environment. So to then share, 
you know, when you came, for example, when you came um, 15 minutes late to your appointment and then complained about everything that else you had to do today um, and, you know, how this was kind of a drag on you, like, here's my emotional reaction to that. Like, I felt undervalued, you know, and there's, there's probably for a lot of us, there's like this this thought process of you're, you're the professional, you shouldn't be having these feelings. Um, but there's also that very human part of us that's going to have those feelings. And, um, you know, I would argue there's, there's real value in that. And if we have that response, um, and we can share that in a way, again, that's safe for the client, and that allows it to quickly move into process as opposed to like going some very negative, you know, argumentative place, but to move into process and to connect that back to their treatment goals, then that might be um, a real um, you know, change op- opportunity for that client. Absolutely. Um, tell me more about polyvagal theory. And for those people who don't know what it is, tell us more about it and how you see its application in this conversation about countertransference. So polyvagal theory um, looks at a biobehavioral um, approach to um, how our nervous system allows us to sense safety. Um, so we, you know, we hear a lot about sympathetic nervous system arousal, um, fight or flight response, which allows us to, you know, manage those biologically, those life and death situations, you know, today they're, they're usually hopefully not life and death situations, but those moments of, you know, flash of arousal and energy, um, in order to manage a perceived threat. Whereas polyvagal theory, um, part of the idea behind that is it, it might be what happens when people tend, when people aren't safe enough to have emotional reactions and to kind of dissociate or disconnect from an experience. Um, so polyvagal theory looks at the way um, a lot of nonverbals, um, things about facial expression, eyes, you know, we can say something like, you know, I really hear you and that, that you know, feels really sad. Um, And I could say that with a pretty blank face, um, which I think if we were having, you know, a face-to-face conversation, you say, well, that doesn't really feel very genuine. Um, Or I can say that in a way where, you know, you can tell by my tone of voice, by my facial expression, by the way, um, you know, my mouth, my eyes, all those tiny micro muscles in the face are um, moving and probably outside of our conscious awareness, but something that, um, you know, just biologically as social creatures were programmed to read and respond to from other people. Um, and when that is aligned, you know, when our, when we are able to match that between um, two people, then that emotional expression, you know, can occur and kind of resolve. Um, and I, I definitely have like a strong piece of um, biological basis for behavior in, in my approach to things. And I look at like the um, the evolutionary piece of it. And, you know, that's probably what allowed a highly complex social species to um, survive as long as we have and do as well as we have. We have, you know, infants that come into this world completely dependent. And if we can, um, you know, quickly learn to match needs between, you know, caregivers and, and children, and then, you know, later, you know, between partners, between groups of people that are working towards the common goal, if we're able to read each other and match to that, um, to what people's needs are and what their um, need for safety is and for emotional expression is, we're going to be a healthier group. But on the one-on-one, you know, within the context of therapy, it would be all those things. I think it's kind of the the biological piece um, for what we call rapport. So, you know, when that when you feel this strong sense of rapport and connection with a client, I think some of that is probably this polyvagal um, network uh, lighting up and lining up with another person. Thank you for sharing about that. I can definitely see its application and where that can be an area, again, of vulnerability for clinicians when, um, I mean, I, I know for me, I kind of feel this bloom in my chest where it's like, oh, something feels weird and bad right now. You know, like whatever it was, it just happened. And then the challenge of what we do with that when there's something that kind of crashed into um, our values or the way that we see something or perspective or whatever it is, and then how to work with that therapeutically um, is, is really a challenge. And when we do develop that really strong attunement, we can move into a space where that connection is there. Um, and again, like that, that vulnerability that you mentioned on our, you know, on the therapist's behalf um, is real. But I think we also then um, 
you know, for, for better, for worse, it just is what it is. You know, we look to our clients then for, um, you know, some give and take along that and some connection that like that they're aligned with where we're at, you know, when we, you know, when we do share that. So it's, it's kind of a two way street. So <laughs> Absolutely. And I can see for a client, um, if they're, and they are reading our body language just as much as we're reading theirs, when they can see that there's this kind of values conflict or whatever it is that's coming up for a therapist, how disorienting that could be if the therapist is having an authentic reaction internally, but then outside is, you know, like a duck, so to speak, smooth on the surface and paddling <laughs> underneath the water. But there's this misattunement that can occur and that that could also contribute to um, the degradation of rapport. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Then we're suddenly, we're not genuine. And I think if you had to take like a list of like what our clients searching for in therapists and what are therapists hoping to be um, for their clients, you know, I think a lot of us would probably have genuine, warm, approachable um, on that, that list of values. And if we have a strong emotional reaction and we stuff it because either we don't feel safe as therapists sharing it, you know, it feels counter to our training, or even if we, you know, feel safe, like there's this judging voice of, you know, make sure you're doing, um, you're doing all this only for a therapeutic process, which I would agree with that. Um, but I, I think if there is that strong of a reaction, probably it does tie in somehow to therapeutic process. You know, if, if a client is pulling such a strong reaction from us, um, again, with the assumption that we're generally in a healthy emotional place, um, if we're having that strong of a reaction in our, you know, 45, 50 minute time with them, you know, once a week, um, it's likely that that's probably happening in other aspects of their life. Absolutely. It gives us an opportunity to maybe bring into the room what otherwise wouldn't be in the room and maybe beneficial for the client to talk it and talk it through in a way that's safe and safe and, and may not be confrontational as it might be at the grocery store or, you know, with a spouse or whatever it is. Um, so when it comes to viewing a therapist's emotional experience, how do things like culture um, or power dynamics come into play? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of considerations when using this information. Um, culture um, is definitely one of them. So understanding the client's culture and how it may be similar or different from the the main culture that the therapist is comfortable in, whatever that might be. Um, and I think when we say culture, for a lot of us, we quickly think like ethnicity or um, you know, regional kinds of issues or race or religion. Um, but culture can even be, um, there can be diagnostic kind of related things that are that individual's culture. So for a client who's had um, maybe 10 years of depression, um, their individual culture, their signs and signals might be a little bit different than, you know, a therapist who has not had that experience as, you know, um, the, the lens that they're going to be perceiving nonverbal si signs and signals through um, is going to be a little bit different. So there's a, there's a number of things that can go into that. So, you know, I think in, in understanding the cultures of the folks that you work with um, and, you know, being sensitive to how those might be similar, different than your own and, when we're comfortable with that and we're comfortable with the limitations of our own knowledge, um, you know, when we're exploring these reactions that we might have in, um, in therapeutically with a client, you know, we can also be, be free to ask a question like, is my perception of what's happening? Is that your perception is the intention that you have in sharing that there, you know, there's a number of ways that we can explore that uh, without, you know, kind of coming across dogmatically as like, this is my experience and therefore that's the only way um, you know, to experience you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does. And I can see how, again, this impacts things like fee setting and starting session early or late or phone calls or all of these things. Like what, what do we do when we are both observing an experience and also active experiencers in that and how all of these things relate to one another? Um, when it comes to using present moment emotional experience of the therapist, what are some considerations that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about bringing ourselves into the room? Yeah. So uh, there's, there's a number, I think a key one um, that we already touched on briefly is rapport. Um, so how well do I know the client and how well can I judge their reaction to what I'm about to share? Um, so I probably um, would be hesitant to bring up my own emotional reaction to a client during an intake. Um, 
that in, in my framework, um, that's an opportunity to establish rapport, um, not challenge it <laughs> like you might be by bringing up something that's a little bit more sensitive, but to establish rapport, to establish treatment goals, to establish the therapeutic setting as a safe place um, you know, where information is confidential. Um, but if I do know a client well over time, um, I may be able to judge better, you know, how are they going to react to what I share? Um, is this a real area of sensitivity for them? Are they going to interpret, um, my sharing this as a rejection? Um, uh, are they going to feel very sensitive to the feedback that I give them? Uh, and, you know, hopefully if it's a client that I have strong rapport with, um, they have a, a kind of a framework around my role as somebody who's trying to help them. Um, so if I you know, share something that might be sensitive, might be a little unpleasant to discuss in the present moment, um, we can go back to, you know, connecting that to why we're here to start with, what they're wanting to work on in therapy, um, and how we might, you know, use this information as a, a way to um, illuminate an issue uh, and, and move forward from that. So rapport is definitely one. Um, some other considerations, um, timing. Timing is a huge one. And we can think of timing in terms of the length of therapy, which probably taps back into rapport. So I don't know that I'd be doing this, you know, at the very outset of a therapeutic um, relationship with somebody. Um, I also don't know that I'd necessarily be doing this at the very end. Um, I it could probably give you some examples and make some arguments of times when it would be a good idea. Um, but if it's something, you know, if we are working on something very specific, you know, maybe in a more of a short-term therapy model um, and something comes up um, in, you know, a final appointment, um, you know, I would, I would want to really be introspective about timing and whether that's supporting a therapeutic goal um, in bringing that up at that point. But I do think at the end of therapy, you know, issues around separation, saying goodbye, you know, healthy ways of ending relationships like that is such a rich area that we can tap into um, and share with clients. Um, another timing consideration is just timing in the session. So if you have a 45 or 50 minute session and you bring up at minute 43, hey, when you walked in and didn't make eye contact with me, that didn't feel really good. Like now you got two minutes, <laughs> maybe seven minutes to process that. Um, and that might not be real helpful to the client. Um, it might not be something that you can kind of contain and, um, you know, move in more of a healing direction with in that short of a period of time. So I'd also be looking to like the timing in the, in the session and do I have time as a therapist to manage this information in a way that's going to be therapeutic to the client. Um, another consideration would be the connection to treatment goals. Um, and that again, um, if we're looking at it more relationally, if we're having very strong reactions in the therapy appointment, um, I, I think the chances are pretty strong. Um, if, you know, if we, as therapists are well connected to our own emotions um, and have a pretty healthy um, emotional life. Um, if we have that strong of a reaction to somebody, it's likely that there's something going on there that's worth exploring. Um, and uh, that would probably connect back to, you know, it might be around treatment goals around social anxiety or treatment goals around communication patterns or relationship skills. Um, there's a variety of different things that it could be connected to depending on the situation. But ultimately when we're doing that, I think, you know, we want to be in the position where if we're sharing information, it's ultimately to help the client. Um, and again, not, you know, not to start an argument not to be right, not to further our own individual needs. And that's where, you know, really being in touch with yourself and being in a healthy place, um, for, you know, for all of us is, is super important. I think the idea of how all these um, elements come together for therapists, it happens so quickly in the room. Yes. Um, <laughs> I know like it's not one of those things where we can take a minute and be like, a minute, we're going to come back and talk about that next week. You know, yeah. it's like it's in it's in the moment when a client says, I want to talk to you about our rate. I need a discount. Mm -hmm. And then there's this very fast values check that has to go on internally mm -hmm. and then an assessment of, you know, how authentic as a therapist do I feel in addressing this? And I, I know for me, I had a situation where a client had a um, 
very, very nice car, significantly nicer than my own (laughs) and, you know, was dressed very, very well and was accessorized very well, if you will. And then came in and said, I, you know, I, I need a discount. And that, and that client and I had worked together for a while. And so we were able to bring it into the room and talk about what is the significance of mental health treatment? What does it feel like to need therapy Mm -hmm. and um, feel like you're spending resources that you've worked so hard for this way? And it was a much bigger exploration. But as soon as the question came, it's like the bloom happened in my chest of like, oh my goodness, this stuff happens very, very quickly. And this idea of needing to use our own (laughs) mindfulness and values to help be the barometer on on guiding our policies and making sure that we're making choices that are consistent with what feels right for us as practitioners. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think it's something that does get easier probably with practice. Um, and just as you, you know, shared what your physiological sign is, you know, we all have those signs. Um, and if we can recognize them and then give ourselves permission, you know, to you know, maybe to take a deep breath and maybe it just takes, you know, one deep breath and some, you know, um, recentering to then move into, you know, that's an important question. Um, it's also not something I want to make a snap judgment about and, um, you know, something I would like to explore with you. So do I have your permission, you know, to talk that through with you that can not only, you know, open it up to conversation, but it also can kind of help the therapist to, buy a little bit of time, reset, really explore, like, what's the reaction that I'm having right now? Um, and is this something that um, I'm going to bring in, you know, bring into the uh, therapy appointment and work through with my client? Absolutely. And, and thinking about my example, it ended up being such a rich topic for us when we actually talked about money and power dynamics and mental health treatment and early childhood messaging and all of these things actually ended up spanning sessions in this exploration about money that had never happened before. And it, but that said, when it happened, it was, it was uneasy for me. Uh, And I think any listener has been in the same kind of shoes where you're like, oh, no. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that, that also though, that like, this feels uneasy and uncomfortable. Like that's right now present moment experience. And to even feel safe enough to share that with a client, you know, um, you brought up reducing um, fees and I have to share with you, honestly, um, I feel kind of uncomfortable talking about this and I'm wondering what that's like for you. You know, that's a real powerful way to, to share that um, and, you know, to open some conversation and exploration. Absolutely. And I, and I think also we have this opportunity for a corrective experience to be able to talk about the hard topics and to model for clients, hey, you know, I, I'm okay with going there. Effectively, I will proverbially hold your hand and we're going to talk about this uncomfortable thing together. So what are some examples that you have of how to use kind of this present moment experiencing the application of ACT and also polyvagal theory in practice? Yeah, I have a couple of, um, of examples um, from cases where I've had experiences where I've been able to bring them up. And, and there's a lot of changes I've made to these. So um, these, are, these are not blow by blow accounts of anything that happened in the therapy appointment. Um, but one example that I have is, um, a young man in his twenties, um, in therapy for depression. Um, and the depression we revealed over time was largely secondary to isolation and social skills, um, deficits. Um, and I had been working with him for, um, for a good amount of time, um, and went out into the waiting room, um, to bring him back for his appointment went out, said hello, um, looked around the waiting room, saw him um, and um, his partner. Um, Partner said hello to me, made eye contact, um, but my client didn't look up from his phone, Um, you know, just kind of finished up what he was doing on his phone, got up, put the phone in the pocket, you know, and kind of followed me back to my office. Um, And my my immediate reaction was just dis-ease. it's uncomfortable. It's uneasy. I felt like I was interrupting something. Um, I felt out of place in my own office, which isn't a great way to feel when, you know, when you're supposed to be the professional. Right. Um, and, you know, just kind of noticed and tapped into those dis- feelings of discomfort, but they weren't super strong feelings and they weren't, um, things where I feel like, well, I can't, I can't be therapeutic with this client, but just, it feels kind of weird to me. Um, and the thought process that I had, 
you know, was like, I kind of expect my clients to greet me a certain way to say hello. I would expect that of somebody that I, you know, passed in the hallway at my office building. Um, if I was meeting this person socially, I probably would have thought, you know, they were preoccupied. They were a little bit rude. They were really uncomfortable. Um, but they, they wouldn't have been giving off a, a real strong sense of like, I want to connect. Um, but I brought the client back into therapy and, you know, again, what you just described that moment of like, okay, what do I do with this? Do I use this immediately? Do I sit on this? Is this just more, you know, more information about how this person interacts with people or is this something I bring up? Um, and when I checked in with my client about how their week had been, it was actually a golden opportunity because, um, he shared that he had been at a kind of a class reunion of sorts from high school and, um, when I asked how that had gone, um, he kind of said, you know, it was, it was kind of okay. It was, it was disappointing because I, I talked to some people, but, you know, the conversations just died out really quickly. And it was like the light bulb went off for me of this is the experience that I just had, you know, with you was the conversation would have died out really quickly because um, you weren't, you know, you weren't connecting, you weren't sharing with me a way, a way in, so to speak, into your world so that we would have something to talk about. Um, so, you know, I thinking about those considerations that I brought up earlier before I went into sharing this, you know, I was thinking about what's the timing it was towards the beginning of the session, which was great. It was plenty of time to talk about it, um, and to tie things up, um, before the end of the appointment. It was somebody I already knew pretty well and felt that my read was, was probably, you know, not overly culturally, culturally laden on my part, but a, probably a pretty appropriate read um, on this client and the way they present to others. Um, and it was definitely connected to treatment goals because we were working on social isolation, social anxiety. So my thought was by sharing this information um, in a helpful way that I'll be able to um, be helpful to the client. Um, and then, you know, I also think like in doing this, asking for permission before we share these kinds of things um, is important. Even, you know, most clients I think are going to say, sure, you know, you can share something with me. Um, you know, but in doing that, we're, we're kind of showing respect for, um, for the frame of therapy and that we're altering the frame a little bit by bringing up our own experience. So, you know, if I were to say, you know, hey, Joe, um, you just described being at your reunion and feeling like conversations died out kind of quickly. And I'm thinking about that. Um, and I'm also thinking about kind of my experiences with you today. Um, is it okay for me to share that with you? And he said, yes. Um, and I shared, you know, when I came out into the waiting room today um, and, you know, greeted you and your partner. And um, my experience was that you didn't look at me um, you were looking at your phone and you didn't say anything to me. You finished what you were doing and then kind of followed me without really making eye contact. Um, and this is kind of the buffer piece that I would build into this is, you know, I've known you for a little while and I feel like we have a pretty good relationship. Is that right? And, you know, which he affirmed. Um, and I said that, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what my, what you think my impression might have been from how you greeted me. Um, and he was able to, you know, accurately say, well, I probably didn't, you know, didn't seem like I was real excited to see you. Um, and, you know, and it gave us the opportunity to explore that. Like, are, were you aware that that's what my reaction would be? Was that your intention um, in how you greeted me? Um, what would you like, you know, when I come out there to greet you? What kind of reaction would you like um, me to have to seeing you for the first time in a week? Um, and then we can broaden from there to, you know, what's this like in the rest of your life? And how might this have been similar to what happened for you at that class reunion that you went to? So there's some really good opportunities there um, in the present moment to increase a person's awareness for their impact on others. Um, to teach some skills. Like if that was just a skill deficit, if he said, you know, I really do want to connect with you. Um, and I am excited to see you when I haven't seen you in a week or excited to check in and work on some things, but I really don't know what to do. Like that's, you know, let's, let's dig in there and teach some really specific skills. Um, there's an opportunity there to explore values, you know, values around friendship values around relation, you know, being in relation with others. Um, 
values around even kindness and, and social courtesies and things like that. Um, and if those are, you know, if we dig into those values and those are values that the client endorse, endorses, this is the act piece is then let's use that information to build values driven behavior. So behavior that's in alignment with values. I like that example because it shows, I think, the gentleness in how you are able to talk with a client and bring up your lived experience in a way that wasn't condescending or snappy and how out in the real world the fear that you know when we misstep is someone going to just not return our calls or are they going to disengage with from us socially or are they going to snap at us and say something mean and the opportunity to bring safety into a topic that otherwise may not feel safe at all you know things like you're saying about how you're approaching somebody and what I call connectability, you know, like when the connectability has been impacted, like, can we talk about that? And then also these other big topics, you know, from a therapeutic or from a therapist standpoint, like fee setting or timing and boundaries um, and bringing these things that otherwise wouldn't really be in the room. We don't tiptoe around them. You can bring them in gently and delicately as kind of a mindfulness based and values based exercise. I would be willing to bet that anybody listening is going like, yep, had something like that happen, you know, like, and, or have had many experiences like that where we have this just very human moment of something's brought up and then it brings up all the stuff for us too, you know, of our conditioning and our culture and, and our beliefs and our values, and then how to kind of meet in the middle and work in that space in between two people. One thing I think also to consider is what can happen when we do bring ourselves into the room and it effectively backfires, that it doesn't go the way that we're hoping it will. What are your thoughts on that and kind of your experience and insight of the um, kind of trials and tribulations of using countertransference as a tool in the therapy room? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there is inherent risk, and that's probably why we feel vulnerable when we do it, because that vulnerability is our own um, safety mechanism saying, hey, like you're wading out into kind of uncharted waters right now. Um, we can't control a client reaction. And you know, the examples that we've uh, talked about already have been, you know, times when that information has really helped to move through therapeutic change and the client was in a space of being able to hear that. So as much as we frame the information as helpful, um, as much as we provide opportunity for the client to provide us with feedback about whether our interpretation was accurate, um, and as gently as we might do that, there's going to be times when, you know, it's, it's going to basically fall flat. So um, I'm thinking of an example with um, an adolescent client who um, kind of felt pushed into therapy by parents um, and decided they weren't going to talk to me. Um, and after, you know, several appointments of um, working with this individual and, and trying to build rapport, um, I decided to take the tact of um, sharing my experience of, you know, right now, um, when you're not making eye contact with me um, and you're not talking to me and you're, um, you know, using your phone um, during session, when we've already discussed that that, you know, wasn't really appropriate during session, um, here's, here's how I feel. Um, and I, and that particular individual at the time basically looked up at me, kind of shrugged their shoulders, raised their eyebrows a little bit, went back to their phone <laughs> and it just was like, boom, that one fell flat. Um, and, you know, and, and not surprisingly that, that individual left therapy shortly after, um, I think that was probably the last appointment we had had because we really weren't going anywhere. And to me, that felt like a values conflict of I'm getting paid, um, to sit here and, and really not have somebody engage with me. And I, I don't think that was real helpful. And it became a power struggle between parent and child, um, which was playing out in my office. Um, but my, my thought about that is, and I, I've, I've felt this way for quite a while that the work that we're doing in therapy, um, we may not always see the outcome of that. Um, we might be doing, we might be that just that initial person um, that feels safe. Um, so a client might not be ready to change for any number of reasons, but if we've provided um, a safe, you know, warm and welcoming place where um, even if they don't trust us, you know, we've, we've done what we can to build trust and communicate safety um, that we might be uh, just like a step on their journey. And maybe with the next therapist, like this example that I gave, um, you know, maybe 
maybe in two years, this teenager goes and sees um, a different therapist um, and, you know, realizes, look, I don't really have to play that game because that game didn't, didn't work out all that well for me in the long run. Um, but I, you know, I know that this might be somebody who really does want to help me. Thank you for bringing up this topic. And when we we have all these wonderful intentions and then it doesn't go the way that we're hoping it will to create the safe space where we can walk around and look at this phenomenon as it occurs. And sometimes it simply is going to go belly up, whether that's in a big way or a little way, it may not always play out the way we're hoping it will. So when you're looking at this through the this kind of framework, I think of mindfulness and a very rapid kind of values assessment or advanced knowledge, I guess, of values. How do you see this coming into play with the maintenance of the business aspect of private practice? Yeah. So I think um, the the piece that that you just said that really resonated with me was like kind of this intentionality around our values um, and and connection with them. You know, in the moment to to feel that conflict and to be able to tap into them is great, but we tend to do a better job of that if we already have a good sense of them already. And, and, and we know like, these are my hot buttons because these are values that are really important to me. Um, but in, in setting boundaries around our business, um, again, often, you know, when we have those moments of um, strong emotional reaction, that can, that can give us a lens into that, um, into times when those boundaries are being pushed or those values are being um, pushed or in conflict with what our experience is. Um, so a lot of, of folks, I, you know, I think a really positive activity is uh, for therapists to, to go through like a values checklist and, um, you know, circle the ones that they really align with, pick the top five to 10, um, and really reflect on how those show up for them. Um, in their business, because, you know, I would bet my bottom dollar that they're showing up in very significant ways in their business. Um, and a lot of times what I hear from, um, from providers is that they really value service, they value justice, they value compassion, experience, competency, um, empowerment, acceptance, unconditional positive regard. Um, those are real strong values for lots of providers. Um, and then you have this other role that we're carrying as a business owner, um, which we we have to, um, if we're going to have a solvent business, we have to be able to manage um, the financial aspect of staying in business. Um, we have to be able to value our time um, and how that time is shared with people. Um, and those things can come in conflict. You know, the idea that I want to be of service and I want to be compassionate, um, but my client showed up you know, 25 minutes late, last client of the day, and I've already left for home. What do I do with that information now? You know, do I charge them a fee? Do I, um, you know, do I tell them all I understand um, that there's traffic and, you know, you, you didn't call me because your phone battery was dead or, or you know, whatever it might be. Like th those are those are not easy situations to deal with, um, and you know we have policies, right? And if we have policies that did were built without a deep reflection on what our values are around that, they can be really hard to enforce because we don't we don't feel them like they're not authentic and aligned with who we are. If we just pick up, you know, the policies that a colleague has and they lend us their initial paperwork and we say, oh, okay, that, that looks like a good policy for me too, but we don't feel it, you know, deep inside of us, then it's going to be really hard to enforce it and do it in a way that feels compassionate. This topic I see really hotly contested at conferences, at um, just in conversations, at case consultations on social media and the difficulty around things like uh, fee setting or when when to enforce a cancellation policy or when you let it slide and say just this once. And I think a lot of us struggle with um, that uh, connection to our values and wanting to default to like, okay, basically, can someone give me what I would call kind of the idiot's guide to private practice? Just tell me what to do. Um, but then there's this lack of authenticity because it may not actually align with us. You know, and I have some colleagues that will hold the line on a cancellation policy every single time, barring something catastrophic and other ones that it's like, I hold it maybe one out of 10 times and that works for me. But going back to the idea of what works for me, that that's something we need to know as clinicians to help guide 
our decision making and our our business practices. And and that's the thing. Like this is not a one size fits all business that that we're in. You know, even if we're doing things very similarly um, in terms of treatment, um, there's things about me. There's things about you. There's things about every other therapist out there that are very unique about them. And that's what really helps each of us to connect with. Um, the clients that we work best with, um, and our val- I believe our values are a piece of that as well. So when we can um, adopt policies and procedures and ways of relating that are really values aligned, we don't get into like these internal debates anymore of like, do I, do I charge? Do I not charge? Do I tell them just this once? Um, do I think about the last eight people I saw and whether I charge them or not in the same situation? Um, we're able to kind of realize that we've we've set policy that's right for us um, and then when we enforce that it doesn't create this this big internal conflict between service and um, you know financial value the idea of kind of the um, application of mindfulness and values to things like fee setting or um, whether or not to talk with clients over the phone over the weekend, things like that, that are really personal decisions. Outside of doing, um, well, I should say, in addition to doing a values exercise and, and that exploration of, you know, here, here are some of the things that are most important to me as an individual, and here's how this may inform my policies and procedures. How do we and do we ever bring those things into the room um, on a case by case basis? So I guess I'm thinking, um, do you have any examples of someone, say, perpetually running late and maybe a therapist difficulty addressing that or how it feels for the therapist and bringing it again into the therapist's emotional experience and this habit that the client might have? Yeah. So with that example um, of somebody who's perpetually running late, um, well, there's probably there's probably two ways of handling it. One is not 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 handling it at all, or not commenting on it, and the other, you know, is to address it with the client. Um, and I think you know we can use like that same kind of framework that uh, that I shared with those other examples with a situation like that, you know, to you know greet the client, let them get settled, um, and then kind of jump into you know before we get into how the week's gone, um, I'm wondering if I can share something with you and ask, ask for their permission and then share, you know, I'm, I'm noticing um, that you're a little late today. Um, but I'm, I'm also noticing over the last several appointments that that's been a pattern for you. And I just want to check in with you about that. So that's a really like, again, that's kind of a mindful, here's the experience. I'm noticing that you came in late um, and I'm bringing curiosity to, is this something that we can explore and talk about together? It's not a judgment of, you know, you, you showed up late three weeks in a row and I'm tired of you wasting my time. Like that would be a really judgment laden, um, and not something I would recommend anyone do, but a really judgment laden way to, um, you know, to broach that topic with a client. Um, but like, I could just sit here and like guess at lots of things that might come up from that. You know, it could be that the client shares, you know, my life's been really chaotic lately and I'm showing up late for everything. Well, then there's your, there's your therapeutic inroad to, let's work on that today. You know, is that something you'd like to work on that we could try and make some gains with? Um, it might be that the client says, you know what, I really don't like coming here. Like this is frightening to me to have to talk about these things. And I, I don't like talking about them and I don't feel good about it. Well, that's really rich information as well. Um, you know, to try and explore how the client maybe can set the pace differently on what you're working on in therapy so that they do feel safer, or maybe to put the boundaries around the deep, uncomfortable parts of, of the therapeutic process and make sure that there's plenty of time for debriefing and for wrapping that up at the end of the appointment so that they leave, you know, maybe a little bit more hopeful and a little bit more goal oriented as opposed to feeling mired in, um, you know, the muck of the, the difficult emotions. Um, so there'd be a, a lot of ways to use information um, like that within therapy. I can see also in those situations where a therapist feels really uncomfortable, say, holding the line about a cancellation fee or not being able or willing to discuss a discount. Well, not able to, but not not the actual discussion, but not being able to offer it or not wanting to. And the difficulty in exploring those boundaries, but also the benefit therapeutically to help create an environment where both the client and the therapist feel comfortable with the frame of therapy. Because I can see situations where therapists may agree to something on the short term, then it becomes a long-term thing. And then there's this development of 
resentment. And I've seen, um, I can't remember where the quote came from, but a quote was, um, resentment is a sign that a boundary has been crossed. And that that can be so informative for us as practitioners to take the, those experiences and then make changes to the way that we operate in our practice so that we feel that values alignment and don't develop and harbor these potentially damaging relationships with clients that that's also on us to make sure that we're holding the frame. Exactly. So when we're really clear about um, what our values are and how those um, come into action through our practice, through how we operate our practice and through the boundaries around our practice in terms of hours of service, scope of expertise, fees, um, availability, uh, you know, off hours and on the weekends. When we're really informed and clear about that, I feel like it allows us to move into a place where we can we can state them. Um, we can give as much explanation as, as we want to or as we don't want to <laughs> about why that's the policy that we have. Um, but then we can quickly move into a space of compassion, you know, rather than getting caught up in this, well, I'm not doing that and you want this and I want this and kind of locking horns about it. Like we can almost more move alongside our client um, and um, sympathize and empathize with, you know, what they're going through. Like I'm understanding that, um, money has been really tight for you and it's been really difficult since your husband um, lost his job and uh, your work hours have been cut. Um, and I know therapy is important to you and you do value the time. Um, and you know, we've talked about whether I have a fee reduction available right now or not. And for the sake of this example, let's say that I don't. Um, but now I, I'm not trying to hold on to a client who's not a good fit for me. Um, I'm trying to go back to, for me, a value of service. So I really want to see you make the gains that will be helpful to you. Um, and here's how I'm going to try and help you. You know, we're going to spend the rest of our appointment today looking at other options. You know, we're going to look at, is it reasonable to decrease the frequency of our appointments? Does it make more sense for me to try and connect you um, with another um, agency in the community that's going to provide you, you know, the services that you need in a way that's going to be more accessible right now based on your financial situation? So it kind of takes us out of like, you know, um, I kind of think of it like this, like school principal kind of mode, like you're in trouble, you did this thing wrong. And here I am a guardian of this practice. Um, and you know, now you have to go, you know, you didn't play according to the rules and you're in trouble, but like now, now I'm, I'm moving in next to you and I'm able to support you, um, and empathize with you and really see that like, you know, you're, you're a human being in a difficult situation. I'm a human being wanting to be of support to you. And I'm going to do my best to do that. I, I really appreciate the, um, realness for lack of a better word. And in, in the example you just gave and kind of that, the human element, um, you and I could probably talk about this for a really long time. And I think it's something that, um, every clinician I've ever talked with certainly struggles with like what's right for me. And I, I had something happen yesterday and went to a colleague and was like, um, how do you feel about that? You know, and having to reckon with like, wow, do I, do I agree with that? That feels right for that person. But does that mean that that fits for me? And that, um, to thine own self be true element of this. Um, in addition to the to the recommendation for a values expiration exercise for clinicians, what are some other ways, if any, that you recommend for clinicians to really kind of do this work and know where they stand and then apply that to their policies and procedures and how they carry themselves in the room in these kind of situations? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to be really thoughtful and intentional about it. Um, you know, again, really exploring what, what works for you, um, really noting when you do have those moments, you know, even if you don't bring them into the room immediately, you know, having some, some reflection and supervision or consultation after the fact um, is really helpful because chances are they'll come up again with somebody else in the future. Um, so, you know, so doing that work, you know, making sure we're taking really good care of ourselves. If we're using our own emotional reaction as a barometer, we want that barometer to be well, well tuned. <laughs> um, and if, if we're going to use that information in a way that's healthy for everybody, um, you know, just some general information on ACT, um, the book ACT made simple by Russ Harris is a really good primer, um, you know, that goes into a lot more detail um, and people can use that therapeutically and to um, look at their own values around it. 
Um, I also have um, a couple of resources. I have um, a web page, which is intentionalprivatepractice.com. That's my coaching and consultation page. Um, and I also have a free Facebook group. It's called Intentional Private Practice Community. Um, and that's just kind of for discussion of how we bring our values into all aspects of private practice. Um, thank you for sharing those resources. I think continuing this practice, this really daily reflection for us as providers and making sure that we're doing things that are consistent with our values. I like that as being um, grounding and also an opportunity for us to practice what we're preaching. <laughs> um, Thank you, Kim, for being with us today. And for our clients that want to get, or excuse me, our, our clinicians that are listening that want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to contact you? Is it through the website? Through the website, there's a contact form on there, um, or folks are welcome to email me at drkimdwyer at gmail.com. Wonderful. Thank you again for your time, Kim. This has been so helpful. Um, and we appreciate you sharing just your insight and examples and expertise on this topic. Sure. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.